right, welcome back everyone. Today, in this video, we're gonna be looking at module 16. So we made a jump from module nine to module 16 for this week's, um, and, and we're gonna be doing 16, 17, and 18. Uh, looking at sensation and perception. Basically, the, 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 we've covered a little bit when we were looking at those earlier chapters or modules, um, but in this case, we're gonna be looking at kind of doing a deeper dive into uh, what is the differences and how do we process all of the information that's coming at us at any given moment. Um, so it's quite a bit of information. It, it's not as brutal as some of the weeks, but but it's still going to be quite a bit, right? So so make sure you get get to your reading and things early. But yeah, 16. Um, so if you want to follow along the book, that's where we're at. If you want to follow along in the PowerPoints, same thing. Um, you know, pull them up on D2L so that way you can kind of uh, cover along as we go. <coughs> uh, as always, listen for the four random facts for, for the for the quiz points, and I believe that's everything. So, um, without further ado, let's get rolling. All right. So, <clears throat> module sixteen: basic concepts of sensation and perception. So, we're going to just look at these these simple things. Then, then the following uh, modules, we're going to be looking at the each sense specifically. So, looking at uh, the sense of sight. Actually, that's where we spend most of our time on is a sense of sight. Uh, humans are very, very sight oriented. We, we, a lot of our brain is uh, utilized for specifically that sense. Um, and then we'll cover all the other senses in another, another little piece. Um, so yeah, there are videos. I've also included several videos for this for with along with this module. Um, so if you look in the content in D2L, you can find some videos looking at sensation and the like. So just a, a heads up there too. If you want to kind of go a little deeper, there's some really interesting things on um, like how optical illusions work and why they work and things like that. So, okay, here we go. So slide two on the PowerPoint, if you're following along. Processing sensations and perceptions, part one. Uh, sensation and perception are actually parts of one continuous process. Okay. So this is important that you understand the difference between these two, right? Sensation is basically all the data that's bombarding our body and our body's ability to register that information coming in. Okay. So if I touch something, right? If I if I touch my finger with the end, with the end of this pen, which I just drew on myself, but oh well, um, I can feel the sensation. Well, essentially, what that is is that pressure that goes in sends a signal through the nerves, the neurotransmitters that are basically in, or the, 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 yeah, the nerves, the, the neurons that are in the finger. Um, and it sends a sensation up by a finger as is it a chain reaction that basically continues up through, it's the spinal cord into the brain, um, where it is then processed. Okay. So the sensation is the process officially, the, the process by which our sensory receptors and nervous system receive and represent stimulus energies from our environment. If you are listening to this video, the, the, the sound waves rippling through the air, the, as the air is basically getting vibrated from the sound from the speakers, right? Um, it enters your ear and it causes the eardrum to engage, which then basically creates a electrical impulse that the brain can then read. That is the sensation, okay? The perception, is the process of organizing and interpreting sensory information, enabling us to recognize meaningful objects and events. Okay. Assuming you're watching the video and not just listening to the background, if I lift up this, right, you can say, right, we're gonna take a closer look at that. There we go. Um, that's a pin, right? The only reason you say that's a pin though, or would say that this is possibly a pin, is because that is what your experiences have been of this thing. So you perceive it as a pin. If you have had no experience with a pin, you might look at this and say it's a stick. Okay. Um, you might have, assuming you've had some kind of experience with sticks. Um, I mean, other things, right? Like, what is this? Okay. Some of you might be like, I know what that is. And when I turn it, you'll be obvious if you know how to read, which again is a perception, right? White out. This is something that I correct my errors with when I'm writing my own papers and the like. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> the perception is the ability to take in the information and then process it and then come up with something new. The fact that you understand what you're hearing right now, again, uh, is, is basically because your brain has learned to interpret the sounds of English, what we call English, 
uh, those sounds that we put together as words that represent something else. Okay. If I clap my hands, you can hear it as a clap, and you the fact that you hear it as like that is uh, is again a perception. Okay. It's basically the sensation is just the 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 raw data going in. Okay. We'll dig into this more, but I just wanted to kind of touch on that first. So sensation, raw data, perception, our ability to interpret that data as something meaningful. So we can actually sense something and perceive it wrong, right? Um, I do I do basic magic tricks, right? I'm, I was that nerdy kid. But uh, basically what, what magic is relying upon is that your senses will be, your perception will be fooled by your senses. Okay, and that's basically the, the whole idea of sleight of hand. Is I'm trying to make you take in information and interpret it incorrectly so that you think something else happened. Okay. Um, slide three, processing sensations and perceptions, part two. Uh, Bottom-up processing, so sensory analysis that begins at the entry level with information flowing from the sensory receptors to the brain. Um, so th this is essentially just the, the most basic level of things, right? Um, it's, it's the entry, it's the very, the information just starting to come in and it's engaging the brain. Okay, it is it is beginning, like, uh, I'm looking for more things that I can look up, right? You see this, okay. And it engages, your brain basically is taking that data, going up to the higher levels and then processing that information. Top-down processing is information processing guided by high-level mental processes as when we construct perceptions by filtering information through our experience and expectations. You assume this is water, but is it? Okay, the, problem, the reason that you might assume that this is water is because generally when you see a glass like this, um, unless maybe you're from certain parts of the South, this would be clear liquid in a quart jar would probably be water, right? If you're from certain parts of the South, this might be also known as moonshine, but this is in fact water. Okay. Oh, you know. Anyway, right. It's like a flower. Is this a real flower? A fake flower? Is it a flower at all? Right. Actually, just a little plastic. This is a fake flower. Um, <clears throat> but it's meant to deceive us into thinking it's a real flower. Okay. Random props that I'm just randomly picking up off my desk. Anyway, so that's the, the, the top-down processing, though, is, is taking all of the experiences you've ever had in your entire life, all that data that has been that's been stored away in your brain, that then allows you to then connect it to the entire worldview around you and make perceptions, make judgments about what it is that you're looking at. Okay. So bottom up, raw data coming in and the brain basically just receiving it and starting to deal with it. Top down is when we make an actual judgment call of what it is that we are perceiving. Okay. Four, slide four, processing sensations and perceptions, part three. All our senses receive sensory stimulation, often using specialized receptor cells, right? We're gonna look at this more in depth when we look at all the senses, when we look at the eyes and all these things. There, each sense has specific things, but they basically all end up working the same way. Okay, the initial tools are different, right? My eyes don't use touch. I'm not like touching all the light waves that, to bring it in. There, but there, there's some energy from the light waves that are basically triggering uh, the receptors in the eye, but then turn that into an electrical impulse. Okay, travels through the neurons, through, through different receptors, into the brain, where it can then be processed. Um, same with touch, same with smell, same with taste, same with hearing. All of these things are basically just taking a given kind of sensation, a given kind of, of uh, data coming in through our senses and translating it into something different. Okay. Um, so the receptor cells transform that stimulation into neural impulses, which is that electrical impulse and delivers the neural information to our brain. Your eyes are basically constantly firing off electrical impulses to the back of the brain where it can then be broken down, whatever you're seeing can be broken down and then turned into the images that we uh, perceive. Okay. Um, transduction is the con uh, conversion of one form of energy into another, which is basically what our sensors are constantly doing. Whether that be touch, whether that be sight, you're taking some form of energy that's in your environment. Okay, for example, right, a little ball. <clears throat> when that hits my hand, 
this when I throw it, it actually does a couple things. One is you're you're actually perceive you're you're taking in the information with your eyes of uh, the fact that it's going up and down. When it lands in your hand, you have the sensation of touch, right? The pressure and how heavy it is approximately. All these things are basically connected to the sense of touch. All of those are are then taking that energy that's coming in. So in this case, the gravity on my hand of the you know the ball sitting there in my hand, um, pressing it down. The, the fact that it's relatively smooth, okay, uh, kind of soft feeling, right? There's some give. All of those things are basically just that that some form of energy, certain amount of pressure being released into my hands, which then are transformed into my perception of touch. Okay. <clears throat> in sensation, the transforming of stimulus energy such as sights, sounds, and smells into neural impulses our brain can interpret. That is what transdu transduction is. It converts data coming in. Right, all the billions of bits of information that are hitting us at any given moment uh, into something that our brain can actually then turn into something useful for us. Okay, first random fact. Here we go. If you cut a starfish, it won't bleed, and that's actually because it doesn't have any blood in it. Um, starfish don't use blood to circulate nutrients in their system. They actually use the seawater that they are around them. They, they pump it into themselves and use that seawater to circulate nutrients in their system. Weird stuff. You also can cut a starfish up, and if you throw it out there in the water again, uh, it can regenerate. And so you can end up taking one starfish and turn it into five or six or seven starfish, depending on if it has enough living cells in it to keep itself going. Weird stuff. Okay. So yeah, remember starfish. There you go. Slide five. Processing sensations and perceptions, part four. Uh, absolute threshold. So the minimum stimulus energy needed to detect a particular stimulus 50% of the time is the absolute threshold. So in other words, if I were to, if, uh, if we were to do an experiment, okay, and you have your earphones on or your earbuds or whatever, okay, um, and I play this a very, very quiet sound, very quiet, okay, uh, I would, I, and I slowly brought the volume up there would be a point where you would hear that sound at that decimal point, that's that specific. Now we'll look at this again, we'll get the senses more in depth. 50% of the time you have a red, like a perception of it. That is the absolute threshold. Okay. You could have technically been sensing it before that, but you, it needs to be enough to actually trigger a perception, a conscious perception of the sound. Okay, so test it by defining the point where half the time a stimulus is detected and half the time it is not. This could be a small light. This could be uh, given a sound. This could be pressure, right? So at what point, how much pressure does it take for you to sense it? And how small does it have to be for you to be able to tell that it's touching? Um, this is something I should do if you're getting the medical field. This will be something that you'll be doing if there's like nerve damage potential. You'll see how much pressure and how big of a thing it takes to actually uh, trigger a perception and not just a sensation. Um, it's based off of Gustav Fichtner's 1801 to 1887s, a German scientist and philosopher who studied our awareness of these faint stimuli. He was fascinated by um, basically our lack of ability to understand the world around us. And so he was curious at what point, like how much stimulus is basically bombarding us that we aren't able to perceive. Um, so in a given environment, you know, certain sounds and things, you might be getting actually bombarded by these things, but you, it's too quiet for you to consciously perceive. Interesting thing, psychologically, even though it's below the threshold, it can be having an effect upon you to some extent. Uh, so even like sounds and things, that even if they're a little too quiet to hear, it could be having an effect upon your brain, but at an unconscious level or a subconscious level um, instead of the actual like obvious expression of it. Okay. Slide six, processing sensations and perceptions, part five, signal detection theory. It predicts how and when we will detect a faint stimulus, the signal amid background stimulation or noise. Um, individual thresholds vary depending on the strength of the signal and on our experience, expectations, motivation, and alertness. Uh, if you know what you're listening for, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna be more likely to hear it. Or if you know you are listening for something, you're gonna be more likely to hear it because you're concentrating on that moment. Uh, this, this would be similar to like the, the cocktail effect, right? Um, where if I, if I put you in a party and there was just kind of a lot of, you know, jabbering people talking all around you and things and you're talking to somebody and I said your name 
15 feet over there, there's a good chance that you would perceive your name because you have been conditioned to listen to that sound. Okay, so in my case, if I heard Sam, if I heard somebody say Sam, my attention would be would lock on to that, even if it was faint, and I was like, I was focused on what this person was saying, that I've been conditioned to actually have that trigger my looking and, and kind of paying attention. Okay. Um, and we have an amazing ability to basically be able to turn off, like I could I can hyper focus on something. So I could be list, talking to you right now and you know listening to you, you're talking back to me if we're having a conversation at a party. I hear my name over here, and for a few seconds I turn you off, my perception of you off. I know that you are still speaking to me. I am still sensing that you are speaking to me, but I'm no longer consciously paying attention to what it is you're saying. You are just making noises at me as far as my brain is concerned. I am now listening to this conversation over here where they mentioned my name to see what the heck it is they're saying about me. Okay. Um, but what sound, how high does the sound need to be in order to engage my uh, attention to it? Allow me to perceive it, given background noises and things like that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Seven, absolute threshold part one. So absolute threshold is the minimum stimulation needed to detect a particular stimulus 50% of the time, like we just said, right? Um, can see a far away light in the dark and feel the slightest touch. Remember, we can, we can see a candle actually from over 10 miles away, a single candle burning, um, for example. Uh, a feather barely brushing you or a little mosquito landed on you, right? If it lands on an area of your body that's more sensitive, you can feel it. If it lands in an area of your body that's not, like say like the back of your neck, you're less likely to feel it. This is kind of a fun experiment you can do. If you take two pencils, to see the differences in, in how things work. I'm probably gonna talk about this again when I get to the sense of touch, but anyway, double up, it's all good. So take a pencil or two pencils, touch them to your finger, okay. Uh, you can tell that there's two separate points even when they are very, very close together. Right? I can still tell that those are two separate points. If I touch the back of my neck, all I can tell is that there's a point touching me. If I separate them, like that, touch the back of my neck, I still feel just one point getting pressured, starting to feel the possibility of two. If I separated them significantly, now I can tell that there are two separate points, but not real easily, okay? Even with them like, like, like really far apart. You're like, I'm getting touched in the back of my neck, and it is in two separate spots, but not like, it's not super, super obvious. Um, that's because we generally don't use our neck to explore the world, right? You know, we're not touching the world with our neck. That's not an average thing. If I touch it to my lip, it'll actually be even more sensitive than if I touch it to my hand. Um, but the tips of the fingers and the mouth are gonna be the primary areas, like our, the most nerve receptors for touch. Um, so that's gonna be that threshold. At what point, how much pressure does it take to detect, to perceive, that you're being touched. If I were to close, if you were to close your eyes or be blindfolded, you know, how much pressure would a certain amount of touch be on a certain area? Once you perceive it 50% of the time, that's your absolute threshold. Um, subliminal is input below the absolute threshold for conscious awareness. So this would be like that sound that is below that mark, right? You don't hear 50% of the time. You might only hear 25% of the time perceiving wise, or you might not ever perceive it. Okay, it might be so low that you just do not, you have 100% of the time, you do not perceive that it's happening, but it is still causing uh, action within your neural system, meaning that you are sensing it, even though you are not perceiving it. Okay, that's a subliminal message. There was a whole bunch of stuff out there, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we're thinking like you could send subliminal messages to people through music and things like that. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll actually dig into that a little bit more when we get into the actual senses. But uh, but yeah, like so this is this is what they're talking about, right? Those sounds that are below the threshold of our perception, and therefore it's an influencing us, even though we're not aware of it. Um, priming is going to be activating often unconsciously associations in our mind, thereby setting us up to perceive, remember, or respond to objects or events in certain ways. Um, for example, if I'm talking about like my beard and things like that, and then I say, how do you spell hair? You're more likely to spell it as like hair on my face, rather, which I think is, if I remember right, I'm a terrible speller, remember dyslexic. But anyway, I think it's H-A-R-E, if I remember right. Versus if I'm talking about rabbits, and I'm like, what, you know, and I mentioned like, how do you spell hair? H-A-R-I, H-A-I-R, blah, dyslexia. Okay, here we go. But anyway, 
Um, and it might be flip flopped. I honestly don't know. But the, the, those two things, right? Those that'll be the differences. If I if I prime you by talking about a certain thing, it can change how you might spell a given word because the associations that your brain assuming you can spell the associations in your brain will connect to that given thing. Okay. <laughs> Oh, the challenges of the dexlexic. Okay, slide eight, <laughs> absolute threshold part two. This is actually a, a clip from the book uh, on this slide. So if you wanna look at your book on page 191, uh, it's, it's just giving you basically an example of, of the absolute threshold. At what point does it connect? And everything below that marker, okay, is, uh, is that subliminal messaging level or stimuli, subliminal stimuli, which might be a message or might not be, okay. Um, okay, slide nine. You know, I just realized I haven't given another you know, random fact. Random fact number two. When you exercise, uh, let's see, the, the fat that you burn becomes carbon dioxide, water, and energy, right? Your body uses the, basically to, keep, to, to give your muscles and things energy. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, though, so the water and the carbon dioxide, though, it's the waste product, essentially. And when you breathe out, you breathe out that excess water and excess carbon dioxide. So you basically breathe out your fat that you burn when you're exercising. Weird stuff. Okay. Um, we'll keep going. Processing sensation and perceptions, part six. Um, difference thres threshold is the minimum difference that a person can detect between any two stimuli half the time. So it increases with stimulus size. Okay. So what, what they've actually found, they... It's not like, uh, here we go. I got a little tiny weight here. Okay, little five pound weight. My brain can easily detect that this is heavier than this. Okay, um, very easily because this is like maybe three ounces, maybe, okay. Maybe, maybe even less. This is five pounds, right? Small weight, easy detection. Um, on the other hand, these two balls, okay, are likely slightly different weights. The gram weights of these varies by about eight to 10 grams per individual juggling ball, okay. Um, I can't tell if there is a difference or not. They might, as far as my brain is concerned, these are exactly the same weight, okay, or close enough to it that I have no idea if one is heavier than the other. Um, and that's because the percentage of weight difference is too close together, okay? The heavier something becomes or the more intense the stimulation becomes, which is basically what weight is, the, uh, the, the greater the difference must be because it will be the same percentage of difference overall, right? So one pound, if it's, let's say it's like a 5% difference between the two things for weight to be able to tell the difference. Uh, so one pound weight, You'd have to go five, like you'd have to it'd be a lot closer together, right? Five percent within, so you're within, you know, about an ounce, give or take. Um, you could tell the difference that one is heavier than the other. A hundred pounds, though, you'd have to have a five-pound difference between the two to be able to tell that one's heavier than the other. Okay. Uh, just gonna look and see. I can't remember if they have anything here in the book about the actual numbers. They don't seem to. Okay. Um, there actually are, there's whole, there's whole uh, charts of these you can find of what the percentages are for the given senses for, their, for you to be able to detect the differences. <coughs> um, so yeah, so increases with stimulus size. Five decibel increase in volume will be noticed at a starting point of 40 decibels. So if you have 40 decibels and I increase the volume by five decibels, you can tell that I've increased the volume, okay? Pretty easily, assuming your ears are working at all correctly, you can de determine that. Um, if I'm at 110 decibels and I increase the volume by five decibels, you can't tell the difference. Okay, you wouldn't perceive my increase. Um, so experienced as a just noticeable difference or JND is at that point, that's what we're looking for. At what point am I able to be like, and accurately for the most part, determine which one's different. Weber's laws for an average person to perceive a difference, two stimuli must differ by a constant minimum percentage, not a constant amount. So it's not like, well, something has to be a pound apart for me to tell the difference no matter what it is. So if I have a one pound object, then I have to have a two pound object for me to figure it out. 
It doesn't work like that. It has to be a certain percentage of increase or decrease to be able to tell the difference. Okay. So the exact proportion varies depending on the stimulus um, and on like distractions and things like that, right? How focused am I on the given thing? So there's lots of variables there for any individual, but there are averages that you can find again those tables for. Okay. <clears throat> Slide 10 and random fact number three. When shuffling a deck of cards, there are eight times 10 to the 67th power possible arrangements. It's actually more possible arrangements than the number of stars in the visible galaxy. Pretty outstanding. It's amazing. One little deck of cards gives you lots of different choices. Okay, <clears throat> slide 10, subliminal per persuasion, right? Um, you can find a, a little bit more information on this on 193, page 193. Um, subliminal stimuli, stimuli are those that are too weak to detect 50% of the time. We've already covered that several times, right? They are below the absolute threshold, reinforcing that information. Subliminal sensation exists, but such, such sensations are too fleeting to enable exploitation with subliminal messages. Okay. Um, basically what they found is that it, it long term it doesn't actually have much of an effect. Subliminal persuasion may produce a fleeting and subtle but not powerful or enduring effect on behavior. Okay, so they, they actually did a bunch of things like there was movie theaters in the past like 1980s early 1990s um, that were like in, inserting like a quick clip right like a, so so I think the average movie screen is showing 24 right um, clips per second which gives you the sensation of constant movement, right? Like a fluid motion. Out of those 24, they would insert one quick clip of somebody like drinking a Coke or eating some popcorn or things like that. And the idea was that it would basically stimulate the person subconsciously that they needed to get up and get some snacks. Um, and what they found, basically what the researchers found is that it in fact does for about this long, okay, this teeny tiny little thing. It, it just, it doesn't, it's not long lasting at all. You have a moment of like, hmm, popcorn, and then it's gone, and that, that drive is gone, okay. Um, the experiment that they talk about in the book was one where, where uh, they, they showed a face, and then they would quickly, rapidly flash a picture of either like cute kittens or something scary or disgusting, and then they would ask the person to give their, their opinion of the, what the picture that they were looking at. Uh, what they found is that if the images that were flashed quickly of negative uh, imagery, the people had more negative feelings toward that individual's picture compared to the ones that are like cute fluffy kittens and things like that. Okay. Um, so it did have an effect, but it wasn't all like a massive one. Okay. It was measurable, but not drastically different. Experiments disprove claims of the effectiveness of so little advertising and self-improvement. So this is also like the idea you might hear people like, you know, you just got, you put earbuds in the morning or while you're sleeping and it's, you play it really quiet of like positive things and all, you know, you're going to lose weight tomorrow. You're going to lose weight tomorrow. That doesn't work. Okay. Long term, it doesn't have any effect. Um, wish it did. That'd be cool. But it, yeah, it doesn't. Okay. Slide 11. Sensory adaptation. Sensory adaptation is diminished sensitivity as a consequence of constant stimulation. Um, and this happens with all the senses. So, for example, okay, uh, you, assuming you have clothing on, you probably weren't consciously aware of the fact until I just mentioned it, right? If we were in a classroom, I'd mention your shoes because that's usually something that you also you notice your feet are like confined inside a shoe. Uh, until you are, are consciously aware of it, though, until I bring your attention to it, your brain has basically turned that off. It is still sensing it, but the perception has been turned off because it's not needed. Okay. Even if I was to sit here and like kind of, you know, you know poke myself with a pin with a relatively constant pressure, but not so much that it causes discomfort, after a relatively short amount of time, I would forget that it's there. This is where you get the sensation of like, you know, where's my phone? I can't find it. Oh, it's right here. Okay. Your brain has desensitized itself to the point because you've held it too much. It has desensitized itself to the point where it, it has forgotten that it's there. Okay. Glasses on your head, right? My mom is known for wearing like three and four pairs of glasses on her head sometimes because she forgets she has a pair on and she puts them up and she can't find them. And so she finds another pair of glasses, puts them on and then puts them up and then can't find them. Okay. Uh, that kind of thing can happen fairly regularly for a lot of people, right? Um, and that, that is that sensory adaptation. We adjust to it. They've actually done experiments that even the eyes, the eyes are constantly shifting 
to basically overcome this sensory adaptation. Uh, so even if I'm trying to hold my eyes super still and just stare at one point, there are going, and you might be able to see this, there are teeny tiny motions in the eye where it constantly is adjusting. This might be really weird looking for you. Um, but basically in those little shifts, it is re-exciting itself about the information. They've actually hooked up things to some people. They did experiments where they had uh, an image that actually moved with the eye. And after a, a relatively short amount of time, it's like 30 seconds to a minute, the image began to disappear. The eye basically lost interest in it and it began to disappear until eventually it totally faded away and the person could no longer perceive it consciously. As soon as they moved it away from the eye's natural rhythm and, and shaking and things, um, they reappeared instantly. Okay, um, this is sensory adaptation, right? It aids focus by reducing background chatter. This is the fact that I can sit in a cocktail effect, right? I can be in a party and have a conversation with you assuming the noise isn't too loud. Um, I can have a conversation with you and, and I can kind of shut out everyone around me. I can very comfortably sit in a, in a relatively noisy waiting room or whatever and read a book and not be aware of what's going on around me whatsoever, right? My brain can hyper-focus on that thing and it shuts out all those extra sounds, all that extra stimulus. Um, so this is, you know, that's that helpful thing. This is also why <clears throat> when you're like, I can't find the place and you turn the radio off, that's actually a helpful thing because you are reducing the background stimulus that is coming in so that your brain can spend more energy focusing on the things that you're trying to focus on. Okay. It influences how the world is perceived in a personally useful way. My perceptions are going to be different than your perceptions, even though we are getting bombarded by the same sensory input. Okay. Um, because of what my brain decides is important or not important. So our sensory receptors are sensitive to novelty. In fact, that we are looking specifically for novelty. Sensory adaptation even influences how we perceive emotions, right? Um, when I, we'll, we'll, I'll show you an image here in just a second. Um, and you can actually find it in the book too. On page 195, um, we can adapt to how we, we are perceiving emotions from individuals um, given our experiences. So we perceive the world not exactly as it is, but as it is useful for us to perceive it. And that's the important takeaway there. Okay. <clears throat> My perception of the world is not 100% accurate as much as I wish it was and as much as I feel like it is. Um, the reality is, is that my perception of the world is shaped by my experiences, by my thinking, by my biology, by how I'm feeling at the moment. All of those things are going to affect how I perceive all of the actions around me. Okay. So slide 12, again, if you look up page 195, you can also find this, but if you have the, the PowerPoint, um, you can pull this up here. <clears throat> uh, this is a little experiment you can do. Stare at image B for 30 seconds. So if you're watching the video and you're, you're, you got the PowerPoint, go ahead and pause the video here. But stare at image B for 30, before actually, don't pause it yet. <laughs> Let me finish the instructions. Stare at image B for 30 seconds. At the end of 30 seconds, shift your eyes over to either A or C, and, and kind of look at what, what emotion do you experience in it? Okay, I think I did that right. Okay, wait, no, let me change that up. Gaze at the angry face, image A. <laughs> Ignore everything I just said a few seconds ago. Uh, stare at the angry face, image A, for 30 seconds, and then go over to B. Okay. Um, and then what, what emotion is she showing? Then do the same thing staring at image C for 30 seconds and then look over at B. Did the emotion change? Okay. Um, most people, not all people, but most people will actually experience that the emotion will have changed what, what they perceive the emotion in image B to be. So go ahead and pause it and give this a try. Um, see what emotions you see and then, and then restart the video. We'll go from there. <clears throat> give me a second. Okay, Boop. you're back. Or you might never have gone away. In any case, what you'll likely have seen is that in, if you've stared at image A first and then move over to B, um, her face will have looked a little bit more scared or at least maybe concerned. If you go from image C over to B, you're more likely to see her as looking more angry. Some of my students say that she just looks constipated all the time, but that's, you know, anyway, that's her own perception. Um, but that's gonna be a common, a common shift. 
Um, B is actually kind of the middle ground between the two emotions, and so therefore it, it is more or less likely to be perceived one way or the other depending on our priming in the previous things. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Slide 13, perceptual set. Um, perceptual set is the mental, mental tendencies and assumptions that affect top-down, or what we hear, taste, feel, and see, the perceptions of it. Okay, so what determines our perceptual set? The schemas that organize and interpret unfamiliar information through experiences. So it's all, again, from birth. This is basically what we are creating at birth, is our perceptual set with our limited senses that we have at birth. We are beginning to create what how the world works, what certain things are, how they are to be used, what a certain sound means. All of that is built into this perceptual set, which then allows us to make quick interpretations of the sensations that are coming into us from the world around us. Okay. So it's pre-existing schemas influence top-down processing of ambiguous sensation interpretation, including gender stereotypes. If I see somebody walking away from me in a dress, I will assume that that is a female. My brain will do just a quick thing, be like, most people you've ever seen in dresses in the past have been female, therefore this must be a female. If that person turns around and has a massive beard, I'm like, change up. Beard means male typically, so therefore this must be a male that happens to be wearing a dress. Okay, that kind of a thing, right? There's certain, there's certain levels of this. With that in mind, go to slide 14. Uh, the context effects. So a given stimulus may trigger different perceptions because of the immediate context. Look at image on page 197. If you're looking at the PowerPoint, you're already there, right? Slide 14. But if you're on the book, 197, look at the image. Where is this family sitting? If you said a house or inside a building, you might be right. Okay. They're actually not sitting anywhere, right? This, this is a drawing with very vague images in the background. If you're American there's or, and or Western world, there's a very high chance that you said, uh, inside a house. Researchers actually showed basically this exact same image to people who are also living in Africa. And they found that the majority of people in Africa said that they were sitting outside under a tree and that the woman sitting on the cushion had a can that was reflective on top of her head. Okay. Americans typically, and Western people, Western Europe and the like, would typically see them as sitting inside that, that thing that they saw as a tree in Africa as a pillar in the, the corner of the house, and that's a window above her head. The schema that we are built in, the, the, the tendency for where we are expecting a family to be sitting and relaxing is what basically shapes our images. And in Africa, most parts of Africa, women will oftentimes carry things on their head um, to, as, a, as a way of a means to get it from wherever they want it to go. Okay. Um, so yeah, interesting, right, that the, our, our expectations of what we would be seeing, where we would be, can shape how we perceive it. Final random fact. Okay, a study found, this is a study, I haven't actually done much research on this one, I, I'm curious about it though. They did a study and they found that video games were more effective uh, at battling depression than therapy was. This is something that I'm curious about because I'm like, that would be an interesting tool possibly, but um, and I'm not even sure like what video, I, I, honestly, it was a quick fact, right? I didn't really dig into the, the, the research at all on this one. The video games, according to this one study, were found to be more effective than therapy at battling depression. Okay. Um, we'll look at, we actually might look at, I might do some research before that clip comes, or before the video comes, where we're looking at the end of this semester with this, uh, in this class, looking at depression and anxiety and all those things and the negative emotions, as well as happiness and things and what might cause that. Okay, final slide, 15, motivation and emotion. Perceptions are also influenced by our motivation and emotions. Uh, walking destinations look further away when we are fatigued, right? I know this for a fact as a backpacker and a guide in the, in the past. Um, if you're going uphill and you got a heavy load on your, pat, on your back, you look up and it can be like 15 feet away and it looks like it's forever, right? You got a quarter mile, that quarter mile suddenly looks like a mile because you're tired. Um, slopes look steeper when we are wearing a heavy backpack or after listening to sad, heavy classical music. Um, it, it, it puts you in a state where it feels harder to do. Water bottles look closer when we are thirsty, right? You're, you, you're like, it's just right there, you can get it. 
So all these things, right, our emotions, what we are sensing, what we are experiencing in the moment, in our feelings, in our biological state, um, in our psychological state, all these things can affect how we perceive the world around us. So emotions and motives also influence our social perceptions. If I have had the best day of my life, everything is going well for me, right? I woke up five minutes before my alarm and I felt rested. I was ready to get up. I got up, had an amazing breakfast, took my shower, everything had plenty of time. I got it done extra fast, so I actually had a few minutes to just sit and, and enjoy the morning, listening to the birds singing as the sun is shining on me and all this. I get in the car, I go to my 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 work, everything went perfectly. I hit all the green lights, right? The weather's beautiful. Uh, traffic was smooth. I didn't have any issues. Uh, I walk in and somebody goes, hey, I want you to, inter I want you to meet so-and-so. Okay. My perception of that person is going to be more likely a positive one because I am in a good mood at that moment. Okay. On the other hand, <clears throat> let's say I slept through my alarm. I wake up and I'm like, I got to get out of here in five minutes. So I don't have time to eat breakfast. I don't have time to get dressed. I barely just like, throw my clothes on. I'm running out the door. It's raining. I'm like, oh, so I, I, I get out to the car. I realize I forgot my keys. I run back into the house, get my keys, go back to the car, get in the car. Car won't start. I have to get out. I look under the hood. I realize the battery got disconnected somehow. So I just, I reconnect the battery. I start driving down the road. I, I get a flat tire. The tire is just, I have to get out in the rain, change the tire. A car drives by and splashes me with puddles. I'm soaking wet. Finally, I hit every red light. Traffic is just garbage. I finally get there. And the person's like, hey, I want you to meet so-and-so. I'm probably going to hate that person, at least initially, okay, because I am in a terrible mood by this point. Life is miserable, and therefore this person is also miserable, okay. Um, that's that's going to be a potential effect there, right? Other things, if I have been abused all my life, I am going to be more likely to read people's faces as either aggressive or fearful than if I've had a very relatively easy life, uh, because the expressions of anger and fear are more useful to me in, in my safety uh, compared to uh, interpreting them as more pleasant or whatever. So if I just see kind of like a, a, a still face, right? The person's just like, no emotion. If I've had a good life, I'm likely to read that as either just like they're just spacing out or tired. If I've had a rougher life where I've been abused and things like that, I'm more likely to read that expression as fear or anger. Okay. Uh, yeah, little bits. All right. I give you the four facts. Give you all the information for this module. Make sure to uh, read through the module. Um, do the two quizzes, right? The one quiz for the chapter itself over the, the the key terms and the like, and then the other one over this lecture with the four random facts. Um, and we'll go from there. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Message me if you have any questions, uh, and I will do my best to get back to you right away. So. Uh, we'll see you in the next video. The next video, we're going to be looking at the sensation of sight. Uh, vision is going to be what we're looking at. So module 17, you want to keep reading ahead. We'll see you there.